So today I'm very excited to welcome three guests to the podcast, which is a first for Behaviour uh, Secrets. With me today, I've got Tom McIntyre, a professor of special education and leader of the Graduate Level Behaviour Disorders Training Programme at Hunter College of the City University of New York. He is also the creator of the BehaviourAdvisor.com website. We also have Kenny Hirschman, manager of the Frankfurt Center for Learning and Scholarly Technologies at the Hunter College School of Education. He's also a doctoral candidate at Teachers College, Columbia University in adult learning and leadership. And I've got Sean Turner, who is currently an adjunct assistant professor at Hunter College within the School of Education, Behaviour Disorders Program and teaches at a transfer high school serving overaged, undercredited youth in the New York City Department of Education. Tom, Kenny and Sean, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So today we're going to talk about the trans theoretical model, sometimes called the stages of change model. And I'd like to start by asking briefly what it is and why it's important for teachers and school leaders to know about. Well, good day, Simon. Uh, let, let me uh, address that question. Uh, but first of all, I'm certain that I speak for my co-presenters when I say it's an honor and a privilege and a pleasure to join you here today and add to your impressive listing of podcasts on your Beacon School Support website. Uh, the privilege is all mine, believe me. I've, I've been wanting to talk about this topic for a long time, and I know you've been working on this for some time, um, and you haven't quite been ready to sort of bring it into the public arena. So I'm really excited to hear about your research today. Indeed, our team is enthused about the trans theoretical model that identifies a person's level of willingness to change their persistent, maladaptive, counterproductive behavior pattern. Based on that assessment, then we use prescribed general approaches of intervention to change those behavior profiles for the better. As educators, we can make use of this model uh, with some modifications to expand that willingness in our intervention resistant students who display antisocial behaviors to work with us on replacing those harmful ways with more pro-social ones. We'd like to tell your audience members all about this model and how it applies to reaching and teaching kids with acting out behavior disorders. Our students who are persistently um, oppositional, defiant, disruptive, destructive, and aggressive. We're talking about kids who are assigned diagnostic labels such as oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, or as phrased in the common vernacular, tough kids. While one's willingness to change their errant behavior patterns exists on a, on a continuum, ranging from get lost, I ain't doing it and you can't make me, to hey, I'm all in, let's get going. The model segments this motivational spectrum into steps or what are called stages. And depending upon the identified stage of emotional readiness to change one's ways, certain recommended approaches known as processes are then activated in order to move an individual to increased levels of motivation and eventually spurring them to take action to change their ways for the better. Uh, we professionals working with these individuals can then implement interventions from our preferred theoretical model or our prof own professional skill set, as long as our interventions are in accord with those particular intervention avenues, those prescribed processes for that particular stage of readiness to change. And that's the derivation of the name trans theoretical. It's an umbrella under which other models or professional orientations can fit. It cuts across and includes all theoretical models in that it explains the change process and then lets the interventionists select from the interventions that they keep handy in their professional tool bag. 
So it doesn't matter where you hang your professional cap on the theoretical orientation hat rack. You can be an advocate or a practitioner of applied behavior analysis, the cognitive behavioral, social, ecological, psychoeducational, or clinical models. The process of change is always the same, as explained by the trans theoretical stages of change framework. It's just the implemented practices that vary. We simply have to keep our mind or keep in our mind that our interventions must match the processes, those intervention avenues that are just designated for the stage of willingness to change in which the young person presently operates. Depending on the stage of readiness, professionals implement their preferred strategies that are in sync with the predetermined processes identified for that particular stage. So that's a quick glance at the model, Simon. And would you like me to go a bit more in depth? Yeah, that, that, I'd, well, I'd like to unpack some of what you said, because you, uh, you said an awful lot there. You squeezed an awful lot in. So in my head, I'm thinking of kids that I've worked with, and there's one phrase that jumps to mind when I'm working with these kind of hard to reach, ready resist, uh, really resistant kids who don't want to engage with interventions. And that's that you, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. They've got to make yes. a decision for themselves that they want to change. And so what, what the stages are saying, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I just want to un test my understanding is we can go from very demoted, demotivated and oppositional to wanting to change to need you know uh making an active to deci decision that i want to change and now need some help and, and there's a set of stages that we go through um and the kind of intervention or the process that we use to support the child kind of depends on their stage of motivation where they are on that scale is that correct yes it is correct according to the model <laughs> <laughs> so how how was this model developed where did it come from originally well, the stages of change model was developed back in the 80s and 90s by two psychologists, Prochaska and Di Clementi. And it was based on their clinical work with adults who engaged in practices that risked their health and their safety. This included unhealthy behaviors ranging from overeating to failure to take their medication to smoking to alcohol and illicit drug abuse. And since that time, thousands of studies have demonstrated the model's utility in promoting positive change in an ever-expanding number of areas. Related to our discussion today, some of the model's applications have, have involved delinquent youth, and interestingly, teachers who were using coercive means to manage their students' behavior in the classroom. Well, to sum it up, it is the preeminent model in clinical settings serving adults, helping them to change unhealthy habits. There are thousands of studies that support this intervention model's effectiveness. And given its success with changing ingrained and intervention resistant behavior profiles, our team has been working to determine how we can bring it into the school building for use with educators and or by educators and, and, and support staff who are working to help kids with behavior challenges make better choices. And um, Simon, should I address the specifics of the models? Um, well, let me just the let applications me just you, of the schools? Let me just ask you a question first, because we're talking about a model that's got a really solid track record over decades i'd just be interested in in your opinion as to why hasn't why why don't we know about this in education why hasn't it made the jump yet to being common practice because we are working as you say with kids who are resistant to change often adults who are resistant to change but what you i just it'd be interested in your personal opinion well, can i answer that Tom? absolutely yeah. Uh, please sean yeah <clears throat> well I, I don't know if Tom explicitly said it, but I think you said it before, Simon, maybe in one of your other podcasts or work on the model. This model has been used predominantly in health related issues such as smoking. So if you look at that variable, right there, it's somewhat defined, whatever the health is, lo losing weight or um, uh, smoking. It's not it's kind of non negotiable. We know what that behavior is, right? And it's between the person 
and that variable, and they usually have some form of counselor or counselor support. So <clears throat> that, uh, that is similar to the educational model because often, this goes back to your first follow-up question with Tom too, um, in the stages, it's very easy to know when a kid says, I don't wanna do any, I don't wanna change. It's okay, now the kid says, I wanna change. And it's more than motivation. They need some help with that. So they've been able to find really success when it's about smoking or weight loss, because it's more than just, I want to lose weight. Now, how do I do this? So I think, so in that, those kind of clinical positions, the model has been really effective. It, there's gaps in it being applied in the educational setting. From my personal view, it's because behaviors or rules in a school are not as black and white as smoking, right? <laughs> smoking is smoking. You either get rid of it or you're not, but there can be a lot of subjectivity, including the teacher's uh, teaching styles, the kids' learning styles, other variables, kids in the class. There's many, many different variables. Um, so I think from, from that aspect, we need, this is why we are very interested in looking at these gaps. We know it works in the health model, so when we go into the educational model, what are the gaps and how can we address that in our work? And so I think we can talk a little bit about that later on, what we're finding about that, because we are finding new gaps as we <clears throat> go on. Certainly, Tom alluded to, there's a gap in the uh, peer-reviewed literature of this model in uh, educational settings. Um, Tom, but there, yeah, go ahead, Tom, yeah. Oh, just talking about those educational settings, this model has been applied in the schools in limited ways, um, used to promote healthy habits among the kids, uh, safety, anti-bullying efforts, and uh, increasing academic achievement. But oddly, as you were saying, Simon, it hasn't yet been applied to students who display disruptive behavior disorders, those school-based externalized behavior patterns that are marked by opposition and defiance and disruption, um, destruction, aggression. And odd to me, at least, when I read about the model, my first thought was that this applied directly with persistent acting out actions. Kids with diagnostic labels like oppositional defiant disorder and, and conduct disorder, and also our learners who bring the urban street corner culture into the schools. And students who haven't yet been assigned educational love, uh, uh, labels for one reason or another, but their behavior interferes with their learning or the learning of others or the teacher's ability to teach the lesson. When I first read about it, I mean, it was this professional epiphany. epiphany. It explained what's behind the curtain when this often witnessed scenario pops up in the schools. Two kids formerly described problematic behavior problems. The administration of an evidence-based intervention works well with one person, one young person, just like in the research studies, but then it fails miserably with the other. The trans-theoretical model helped me to more fully understand the dynamics behind the success or the failure of the evidence-based practices that I'd witnessed or, or heard about over the years. It's all about the student's internal motivation, the emotional readiness to change his or her errant ways to more pro-social conduct. It incisively pointed out an educational truism to me. We can implement a behavior plan's evidence-based research-proven strategies with strict fidelity, but those, those strategies are destined to fail when our behaviorally misdirected young people lack the internal drive to change their present ways. I, oh, and it I, also, when, when I think about this as well, for me, and I don't know what the situation is in the US, but often schools work with kind of families that have dysfunction in them or difficulties with parenting. Um, they offer parenting programs or parent support programs that have, if I'm being kind, very mixed levels of success, often very poor levels of success. Uh, when you look at the research that was originally done on those programs, they had very high levels of success. And part of me wonders whether, um, 
the parent who's being asked to attend the program just hasn't made that decision yet. You know, at the, at the, not at a point where they're motivated to change their going because they've been sent rather than making the personal choice that we want to change things at home and, and, and make them better. Um, and I know it's, it's not strictly within, with, you know, within the student teacher relationship, but parent, you know, a child's family background, the, the, what they're experiencing at home does have a massive impact on their ability to succeed in school. I think you raise a good po a great point, Simon, because I was going to add to what Tom was saying. Um, this model gives language, common language that can be used by parents and teachers and school psychologists or counselors. And, and often what I see as a problem is a student or a child is working with their counselor and in the counselor is using maybe not the trans theoretical model, but some form of stages of change. And the teacher is not understanding that, because uh, unlike smoking, right? The kid still has to go back into the classroom. So the kid's <laughs> in the classroom, but might be in one of those earlier stages where they're saying, I'm trying, but they're struggling. And to a teacher, they're getting frustrated and they're saying, oh, you're full of baloney, buddy. You're not, you're not taking this seriously. And then that, you know, then you get into your applied behavior now, and it, you know, that triggers something else, the consequence becomes a new antecedent. And then all of a sudden you're, but I'm doing the intervention, but you triggered something else. So the intervention can't work. So I see this model uh, as a hope that it could bring more conversations between parents, counselors, and teachers. And as you pointed out, uh, something that came up in our talking is who really needs to do the changing? Is it the teacher or the mm -hmm. kids sometimes? And we need to, um, you know, we're not touching in or trying to cause controversy there, but I think the model does allow us to all look at ourselves as we're interacting and it's not just, oh, okay, this is a student and the student is the problem. The behavior, what's causing the behavior, looking at our own role as parents or teachers or counselors and how are we affecting that behavior? So just a different way to look at, um, you know, it's kind of like you're driving off the road. You don't need to stop the car. You just kind of drive back onto the road. I think this model helps us drive back onto the road in some ways. That's, that's what we kind of look at versus we have to create something new. It is interesting that we should be kind of applying these things to ourselves as the adult in the classroom because i imagine well i know as an adult if you've got a child who's presenting like difficult behavior and you send them out of the room that's very reinforcing for the teacher because you did something and the behavior stopped mm. um that doesn't help the relationship between the adult and the child that doesn't deal with the problem but that unless we have a self-awareness as the adult um we part of the problem and we need to get past that to achieve change. We've danced around what the model actually is. Tom, would you like to walk us through? We've talked about kids go, well, kids and adults go through a series of stages. Could you talk us through what those stages are briefly and what they yeah, might look like? This is a like good time to do that. Yes, exactly. Um, the trans theoretical stages of change model explains the transitional path that individuals travel from their present modus operandi to a new and better response set for responding to circumstances. You explained the stages in detail in one of your self-recording uh, self process uh, podcast, uh, Simon, uh, but let me reiterate those points here for the audience members today. So imagine a staircase with a ground floor and four steps. The ground floor is where just about everyone stands if someone asked us to change our ways of doing something. Our ingrained manner of doing things is comprised of the best ways we've found thus far for handling recurring situations in life. We see no reason to change to other ways. Even if we did see benefits, is it really worth the time and effort to master them? At this level of readiness that was just described, we're in what's known as the pre-contemplation stage, pre-contemplation. That's where our students with acting out behavior disorders are emotionally situated. They see no need to switch out what works presently for them to another socially acceptable behavior that meets the function of their present actions. 
We all know some kids like this, the ones who defend their errant actions, blame others, tell you to take a long walk off a short pier, and or fail to respond positively to the evidence-based strategies listed in their behavior intervention plan that we developed. So the question arises, how do we reach and teach kids on this level? Well, the stages of change model designates certain approaches referred to as processes that will create an awareness of the problem, help the student develop ownership of it, and question their defenses for their present actions. This acknowledgement that a problem exists moves them up a step to the contemplation stage. So just before are, we jump into contemplation, can I just, just ask a question? Um, so the kids at pre-contemplation, pre-contemplation, I imagine, means before thinking, before really accepting you've got a problem. So would these be the kids that kind of like um, blame the teacher, blame the school, push blame back? Whenever you talk to them, it's always someone else's fault or you're getting at me. Are, are, those, are those the kind of kids here? Would they be kids stuck in pre-contemplation? Uh, yes, we... Um, if we asked you to change um, the way you you eat a steak, uh, to, uh, to to move your fork to the other hand and a knife to the other hand and cut it only with backward horizontal motions, you'd say, why? I know how to eat a steak. This is my way of doing it. Um, as Mark Twain, if not, and I'll probably uh, misquote him, but he said, the only people who want change are wet babies. <laughs> that is just, it's, uh, it's working for us. It's the best thing we've found so far. And then teachers often, to end, or school staff, we try to implement interventions and the youngster is just not ready for it. We have to build to that. We have to take them from the I ain't doing it stage to the contemplation stage where they're no longer certain that their present ways are the best life path to follow. They begin to ask questions like, well, what else could I do? And they observe the actions of others more closely. During this stage, they're weighing the pros and cons of switching out their present ways for a new repertoire of acting and reacting. And again, the trans-theoretical model provides us with general approaches, processes, for affecting what is known as decisional balance. We match our preferred interventions to the contemplation stage and the indicated processes in order to promote the person's desire to actually undertake transformative action. If those methods we implement match the processes that were described for the contemplation stage, the scales will tilt the decision to move further into the change process. The motivation, the readiness is now there to step up another tier to the preparation stage. The changers, as they're sometimes called, the, the, the people who are undergoing the change, increase their emotional readiness to actually engage in these new actions. When they become fully mentally committed, when the benefits of changing are recognized as being greater than the drawbacks, thanks to us using interventions that align with the prescribed processes for that stage, they will then leap up another step. There is a preparation stage, and, and that's one area that Sean, Kenny, and I need to modify. We believe we need to modify the trans-theoretical model a bit. As educators, we know that kids don't suddenly and proficiently adopt a new operational way of acting just because they decide to do so. Teachers have already suggested, sometimes demanded, that they show more appropriate classroom behavior. And the misbehaving kids might have really wanted to fit the classroom structure and follow the rules and procedures, but it was all for naught. As with academics, our learners, however motivated, just don't absorb subject matter because they're told to do so where they want to learn. That's why teachers' lessons first demonstrate what to do before having the students practice with partners or in small groups. And then when they're more adept at the steps and the processes, we have them perform the learning task on their own. So our research teams perceives a need to add a component to the mental 
commitment of the preparation stage and skill acquisition. So you were talking teach, almost, are you talking about a coaching process almost? The way we would coach kids to do anything in school. We wouldn't just, if, if you want to teach a child to uh, ride a bike, you, you don't give them a PowerPoint and angular velocity and then say, you're set, off you go. <laughs> it, it takes practice and build up. Is, is that kind of where you're going with that? Yes, in the traditional model, in the clinical model with adults, it was just getting oneself mentally prepared to say, I'm changing. And then they jump into the action stage. And we're saying no in the preparation stage. Well, we're saying yes. But additionally, along with mentally solidifying that you are going to change, you need to know what you're going to do. You need to become more proficient at it. You need to practice it in, uh, in social skills uh, uh, groups, in, in the coaching, um, uh, role playing, uh, that sort of thing, so that the youngsters develop some proficiency in actually displaying the behaviors and are more comfortable than doing it in real life. So, so we prepare the student mentally and in terms of their skills. What comes next? Then they're going to take action. What does that look like? Yeah, rebounding up the deaction stage, it's the next stage, uh, the next step up in the change process. Having become mentally and physically prepared, they're now ready to engage in these newly acquired actions during actual school-based happenings. Now, as you might have already guessed, during this stage, we're engaging in support strategies that align with the processes that accompany this behavioral tier. And that matching of interventions with the processes designed for use with that stage progressively leads to proficiency in the new ways, allowing the student to step up to the final stage of the change process, maintenance, keeping these freshly mastered behavior response patterns intact and keeping the phenomenon of what's known as relapse, relapse to the old ways at bay avoiding and resisting the temptations to return to the former maladaptive pro uh, profile. And certainly the stages are not as distinct and separate as the model describes, the mnemonic device of, of imagining stage -wise, uh, stepwise stages is much like the Roy G. Biv um, a memory device to remember the order of the colors of the rainbow it's a helpful heuristic for remembering how the change process progresses. However, our team recognizes that there's overlap or blending of stages, um, much like a rainbow in which the colors are not actually segmented, but rather they transition um, from one to another. People, people are messy, emotional things, I guess, and they're not robots. They don't move through things and stages mechanistically. Is that, is that what we're saying there? Indeed, that's what we're saying. And rather than that staircase characterization, our team is talking about how the change process might be more akin to the depiction of climbing a ladder in which a person can have individual hands and feet on different rungs at the same time. For example, a student of ours can be in the unsure contemplation stage while participating in the social skills practice lessons in order to gain a sense of how easy or difficult it would be to change, that's the preparation stage. And when seeing a well-liked teacher or some peers from the social skills practice group out in the hallways shows the rehearsed response, that's the action stage. So we could be in different stages at different times, and realizing too that those stages are not actually segmented. So let me stop at this point, Simon, and allow you to, uh, to, to bring in my esteemed colleagues a little bit more. Can I just say, I love that analogy, a ladder with hands and feet, different points, different places. I think that's really, really helpful. So we, we've talked about the kind of the theoretical side um, and we've talked about how this approach originally came from, you know, adult fields around addiction and diet and, you know, alcohol and, and whatever. Now you are researching and validating this approach at the moment, uh, working with real young people in schools. What form has your research taken so far? Hey, I'll go ahead and start with that. And then I think Kenny is gonna add a little bit here. So um, 
Well, we'll start at the beginning. Uh, Tom wanted to create a um, an instrument and uh, create some validity around a, a, an instrument to assess what uh, stage a student was in. And so our initial work, which I think was over a year and a half ago, was uh, we had grad students, in-service and pre-service teachers, uh, take, um, based off a previous survey, um, different behaviors and try to see what stage they thought the child was in based on those behaviors. And uh, from that initial uh, data, we found out that there was a lot of agreement around the pre-contemplation stage, what those behaviors would look like, and a lot of agreement on what uh, maintenance, um, I mean, action maintenance would look like. But there was not as much agreement in the middle. And um, that brought us uh, to a place where we really wanted to go deeper into why that was, as well as um, ensuring that we were going through all the validity, uh, statistical validity necessary for an instrument, because there already are instruments out there around the, di the different models. Uh, and so what we came out with in that process is we've done a, a very extensive review of literature um, even going beyond just this particular model, but other models of change and what's been used, what kind of um, approaches have been used in school and the ways to test the instrument. So um, for, for our purposes, uh, we've been doing a lot of content validity. And so we, uh, Tom and I both have classes with pre-service and in-service grad students in advanced behavioral disorders. And so we have had panel discussions with them We've had them study the model and look at ways that they think it's practical. So we're looking at content validity and practical significance. It doesn't really mean a whole bunch of whatever if uh, <laughs> we um, if it doesn't work for teachers. And uh, what we found out so far is the teachers are very, very excited about this uh, in, in New York City. And one of the reasons is, is it because it allows the, the, the child to be included in the conversation. We're often on an FBA, even though theoretically the child is supposed to be there, a lot of the work is done just observing and by adults, not with the child in mind. Um, it also allows for more collaboration. And so, um, so we found a lot of great information. What do we do when we have kids that are on the autism spectrum? What do we do when we're already doing behavior change, but we're like Tom was saying, how do we address decisional balance and what came out of that was the importance of self-efficacy so not only are we working on the skills the hard skills that are really being worked at with students are going to be a self-efficacy things related to self-efficacy and decisional balance can and you, so that a little bit about what you mean by self-efficacy please so self-efficacy uh in, in simple terms um i can I can do what I say I want to do. And, um, you, you, you know, particularly with older kids, I work with adolescents, efficacy is one of our major issues. I, can't, I don't believe I can pass that. Um, we have regents here. I'm sure you have, you know, in the UK, a lot of different standardized tests. I can't do yeah. it no matter what. So a part of it is developing the efficacy, by efficacy, I why I say it's a hard skill, is not just so much to pull out my chest, you know, super uh, id, every 18 year old kid's got that. I can do it, no problem. <laughs> I can be uh, the LeBron James of the world. No, self-efficacy is I can do, I, I know I can do it because I can do it and I can show evidence that I am doing it and what that means. And that really builds, um, that's very, very important um, that we found with the pre-service teachers uh, and in-service teachers. And then, so what we what we developed so far is one internal survey, and we're going back to revise our ex external survey. Um, and then we've also, out of our research, been, to, been able to tweak the original model. So we're not just doing an assessment. This is what I think is our, our biggest growth here. We're not doing an assessment that's just gonna tell you what stage the kid is in. We're doing um, assessments that allow us to pinpoint the readiness to move from one stage to another stage, and then be able to tie it to specific interventions or strategies that would help us. So, um, 
in the, in, and so we're also trying to take a lot of this edu, edu talk stuff it gets complicated some people call them processes some people call them techniques it gets very confusing and make it very uh, teacher uh, friendly so they can understand this is this is the stage these are the processes these are some strategies that can particularly help so that is where we're at we're also in the process of now having two panel discussions with experts in the field meaning experts with the trans theoretical model experts with school psychologists experts with teachers to do more content validity and we also have some informal interviews with other researchers on this model in the health industry to get their feedback about our changes to the theoretical model and then the final stage would be so that takes place this school year and then the following school year then we'd be ready uh, to uh, take our instruments into the school and then test that with students. But to answer your question, uh, most of our work is sort of indirectly because we're working with teachers in our classes that are already in schools and applying them to different case studies or their own personal um, work with students and behaviors and how the model works. So this is really exciting, isn't it? Because often you have a scale and it describes what the problem is, but then you're left with no practical solution about what to do about the problem. And what you're, what you're doing, if I understand it correctly, is you've, you've got a scale that helps teachers understand where the child is, but, and then maps across to something we can actually do to help the child move around stage. That would be yeah. the, that, that is correct. That's where we see a gap. We, we know there's all these research proven interventions, but they're not directly tied to the readiness to move. And by readiness, we move what Tom was saying, there's a lot of different processes or what they call techniques in each of these stages. Um, and so, you know, we have to be able to match some specific strategies to what's actually going on. And this is really important, isn't it? Because often, certainly in the UK, you'll have an issue around behavior with a student. And then I'm, uh, you can't <laughs> you can't see this on the podcast. I'm, I'm using inverted commas with my fingers. A senior leader says something must be done. And we rush in with often expensive interventions, expensive in terms of time, expensive in terms of money and staffing that then don't have the effect we want them to have. And that might just be because of where the child is on the stages of change, the trans theoretical model. It could be. It also could be that we're not looking at our interventions in all of these different processes, like some of them. I mean, can you can talk a little bit more about those, some of the examples in each of whether we call them processes or techniques, have to do with how I work with others, what support groups I have in place to help me. So that's where you're talking about family. That's where you're talking about, it's not just the teacher and the student, but it's also how are they using those sport mechanisms? How are they practicing strategies? How, how are they, their decisional balance? You know, the, you know what, what is it that they weigh in on this stuff? And then, um, and so there are, you know, in those change, of course, you know, depending on what the behavior is, if it's oppositional, that's one thing. If it's, uh, you know, more of a sensory thing or on the spectrum, then there might not be as much the cognition as much as there is, um, you know, the self-efficacy and the change and different things like that. So it allows, it allows a different lens. That's what we also found out from the teachers. They're like, we did we just thought this was a black and white problem. The intervention isn't working, but now we can see how much of this that the child might actually have been trying to make an improvement, but they needed support in this, um, you know, for example, you know, outbursts, temper, temper tantrums. And so there's a different way to look at that. So that's your approach. Um, what kind of results are you seeing so far? And what kind of reactions are you getting from the teachers who, who, who are using this, the pre-teachers and in-service teachers so far? Because, uh, you know, I think every teacher gets empowered when they see a, a child get empowered. Nobody wants to be Pavlov's dog. They don't want to treat kids as animals and, and manipulating. It's and I think that's, it's called the trans theoretical model, but I always think of it as a transformative model. This is 
an idea, something gets transformed. And I think that's what gets uh, teachers really excited because it's able to, you know, to make, break down the problem into very um, doable pieces and look at something a little bit different than just antecedent and consequences, right? I, and I, if I'm manipulating the antecedents and the consequences and it still doesn't work, now all of a sudden we have something that uh, I can work with the student with, we can be partners with, we can show growth, we can reach out to our other partners. And that's ultimately, you know, you're not going to change an oppositional kid. In, you know, you're not, we have a lot of save, you know, um, teachers who save kids, uh, you know, like the movie Dangerous Minds or things like that. That's, this, that's, this is not what this is about. This is about over time, helping kids develop these particular skills that they're able to, um, you know, look at things um, and so forth like that. Tom, is that, did you get right that, Tom? Or Yes, you know? and um, may even making our students aware of the behavior change process can help them better wrap their minds around what they're going through, why they're hesitant, why they're resistant, why they're feeling like there is some optimism. Uh, additionally, some of our um, teachers have applied the model and the interventions to kids on the autism spectrum and um, to kids with other, um, well, we're, we tend to be focusing on externalized acting out behavior patterns, but we're getting some reports that, you know, this behavior change process applies to anyone who um, needs to change their ways for the better. And there's been a big move over the last few years towards metacognition in general in teaching, hasn't there? So this fits beautifully with that. If you're a teacher or a school leader or say a learning mentor or a counselor or what we would call in the UK a pastoral worker, so not pastoral in the religious sense, but over here we call um, kind of like counselors, more like pastoral workers. And you're working with a child who's presenting behavior issues and they're not really engaging with your supporter interventions as we've just spoken about and you see them stuck in an unhelpful pattern of behavior what action points or insights should you take away from this interview for, for me for me i think that i'll just speak you know what i what i took away from i mean some of this i think i, I had done uh, just part of my own learning i just didn't have a framework to put this gives a framework to look at the problem from a different lens that's the number one thing like it allows you to take a step back and i mean even though we're going to create an assessment there's already assessments out there there's questions out there there's different behavior indicators you can look at it and being able to just move away from if you take anything away is teachers can often put the kids in the, those two categories. The kids that they're just not, they just don't want to do it. They don't want to learn. They don't want to change. They just don't care. Or the kids are beautiful. They, they're doing everything. And it, and it allows you to look at the other three stages. And in what you might think is a kid that's perfectly well behaved, but maybe there's areas of growth. Um, as there are other places, as Tom said, on the ladder. And this allows you to look at how they're using their other systems, because maybe they're doing well in your class, but not doing well in somebody else's class. Maybe they're doing great, but they're not working well with their uh, therapist or their other support staff, which is a, a, you know, a big issue in terms of they're not going to spend the rest of their life in schools. The idea is that we want them to take what they learn in schools and be able to apply it in to terms of what being, you know, whether you're going to college, career, life, just but being independent, you know, and um, that so ever forget the statistical facts that the population that Tom is referring to has the highest incarceration rate, the highest, um, you know, unemployment On rate. dropout rates. Yes. Yeah. And so we, we're talking and, and this world is ever changing. You got to make money and you got to be happy and you have to be a, a, a adaptable. So I think for teachers, this model allows it's not a per, it's not going to give you the solution, but it's going to give you a different lens to maybe re-examine your students um, and be able to show growth. And that and I don't care where we are in the world. 
uh, teachers are under the gun to be able to show growth. So the other part I would say why you want to look at it is your administrators coming to you and saying, I don't see any growth of this kid. This kid is continuously getting on the dean's list or sent to the principal's office. So how can we show growth? You're the, you're the support provider. Well, this is one way to show growth, moving from one stage to another stage and applying specific strategies and you know growth. It might not be where we want to be, but at least we're showing growth. So that's what I would say uh, that the viewers uh, can take um, and apply that uh, at this moment. I think um, to bring Sean and Tom's points together there, I think you, you make such a good point that change is a process that takes time. It rarely comes from a motivational speech. And then you see you know, a quick training montage sequence as you do in the movies, and then suddenly everything's fixed. It is a process over time that we have to work away at. There. But to uh, operationalize, uh, you know, to, uh, to get, bring it down to the nuts and bolts of, well, what can teachers and school staff, support staff do? Our role in helping our behaviorally challenged kids switch to a manner of acting that meets with school expectations uh, can be contained in a quadrant of what, what to do's. First, be aware of the stages and the behavioral indicators for each of those tiers in order to determine the student's present place and the change process. Second, know the procedures that are associated with each stage that when applied advance the learner toward the next step in changing one's ways. As they move through the transition process, they gain increasing self-efficacy, that self-confidence that I can do it, the belief in oneself that one can indeed advance and fully change. Progress and self-efficacy co-construct each other. As kids progress through the change process, they believe in themselves more, they're willing to continue to undertake the change. Third, select and implement mm -hmm. interventions that align with the prescribed processes for the stage in which the young person exists at that moment. Our intervention resistant kids become intervention impossible kids when we mismatch our interventions and stages, when we attempt to implement strategies that belong in another stage. And fourth, build and maintain positive relationships with our students. We are a big influence, perhaps the biggest convincer, in whether our errant urchins decide to engage in the change process. They have to trust us, believing that we are unswervingly supportive in their efforts and hold their best interests in our hearts and our minds. In essence, it all boils down to this. They got to like the messenger if they're going to listen to the message. Kenny, can you tell us about your role in the research and what you've learned along the way that our listeners should take away with them? Um, so I, I come at it from a very different perspective because I don't have the experience in, in schools that Tom and Sean have. I'm an adult researcher. And um, so, you know, I have uh, um, familiarity with developmental psychology. I have a familiarity with how change processes work in adults. And um, so because the, the stages of change model, the trans theoretical model has typically been applied to adults, the existing literature is really geared towards uh, working with adults. It's been um, helpful, I think, to have my perspective in this group in order to translate some of that work into um, how it might apply into younger populations. So what I've picked up is a lot of the, the things that perhaps the three of you take for granted that you, you have the, this familiarity with, with these populations, that you understand uh, sort of the mind of a child that I may not necessarily um, have quite the same perspective on. Um, but one thing that I've really appreciated in this model is the, um, the way that, that it's very interconnected. And as Tom said earlier, it's very fluid. Um, so, uh, you know, a child can exist in multiple stages at once, can be part of partaking in multiple processes at once, um, and, then, and then there are many, many different strategies that can be uh, engaged at once as well. Um, and I think just to also touch on something that Sean said earlier, um, in that 
uh, it's very easy to understand a child that is very um, resistant, and it's very easy to understand a child that gets it and is exhibiting the behaviors that we want. But there's a lot of gray area in between, and this model really helps to clarify and provide some insight and detail in that gray area. What is what are those things that happen in the middle that get somebody from that resistance to um, the behaviors that we really want to see? And that's that's really what I've taken from this. So, if someone who's interested in learning more about this, they might be. And because there's very little that kind of that's been done with kids so far that work is likely to be focused on adults. You've come yeah. from an adult background with a trans theoretical model. Should we have any caveats at the back of our mind or things that we should be aware of before we try and apply what's written about adults to kids? Oh, that, it's a tough question because, um, you know, my, my background doesn't really involve children and the psychology of children um, as much as these other two. Um, uh, researchers, but um, I, I would say, uh, you know, every, every, anytime you're approaching an individual, you have to treat them as an individual. And you can't necessarily take something that might have worked with somebody else and just, um, just try it wholesale on that child. You have to adapt anything that you're doing to the individual that's in front of you. And no matter what we come up with, in terms of, of our own model, in terms of our own intervention strategies, they're still going to have to be adapted to the individual. And so whether you're reading a book that's based on the trans theoretical model as applied to, for adults, primarily with these health behavior changes, and you wanna to try to adapt that into um, a child that's in front of you exhibiting very specific patterns, you have to really think, think through what does this particular child need? What are, what, are, what are these behaviors suggesting about their psychology, about their situation, their context, and always bring it back to that. That's, that to me is the most important thing. So no cookie cutter approaches to yeah. interventions yet, always wrapped around the individual needs of the child. This is to everybody. What's the first step our listeners and viewers can take to find out more about your research and start applying this knowledge in their own settings? Well, there's the easiest one is you know uh, to go to uh, Dr. Mack's site, Behavior Advisor, because um, there's a lot of uh, resources uh, there. Um, and then I think we you, we're going to make a uh, based off of this interview, uh, we were going to add some slides to make a, a video presentation where there'll be some visuals uh, for that. Um, <clears throat> and I think that would be the best place uh, to start. Um, and I'll just add the one thing to keep in mind about the stages of change model or the trans theoretical model is um, the trans, as Tom pointed out, the trans theoretical model is sort of an umbrella for all of these different models of change. And then one thing that came up for us as we go through all of this, and we certainly encourage people to not do things in isolation, but to talk to their colleagues about the model, is that this model everybody goes through this on a daily, this process of change is something, whether you're two years old or you're our age, that we all go through um, for the rest of our lives. So we're all going through different things. I don't want to do something that my wife wants me to change uh, in my, in my <laughs> life. In my house. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, I think there's, so I think we often, as you pointed out, want to go to quick fixes and solve problems. But uh, this, to approach this, is understanding that this is a theory that is, I like what Kenny said, that all human beings have resistance to change, and we all go through change. We've all gone through this process at some point. There's, no matter what the child is, they have succeeded in at some point going through these stages. So they have experience in the stages, just might not be in your classroom. So this just has a habit of allowing you, oh, okay, I'm revisiting some things that you might have been thinking about, but just puts it into a theory model, theoretical model. Um, we asked this of all our guests, um, who's the key figure that's influenced you or what's the key book that's read, that you've read that's had the biggest impact on your practice? Um, I'll start with I'll start with Sean. 
Um, it's, I don't think it's one particular book. I think the, um, the yeah, there's this, I, I think it's the, you're talking about the theory of change itself, right? No, just in general, in terms of your oh, professional just in life. Oh, just in, in Something in that general. inspired you or influenced you. Yeah, I think it, it, it uh, influenced me was uh, Paulo Freire, um, uh, because uh, that uh, to me is, I work with older kids um, that are often on the margins of society. And so this idea of transformation being not just about one discourse changing or one child's world changing, but the world that they interact changing with. So that has uh, influenced me a lot as a teacher and educator to look at how change that a way to look at change, not just being behavior modification, but what, what do I have to change as a teacher? What do I have to change in terms of the classroom? And then how do the children, uh, even if I'm in college, how do the adults work? Which, you know, now we've been COVID, so everything's been online even creates more things you have know, the dynamics how do you change your environments and stuff like that kenny same question to you um i would say uh, bob keegan um harvard professor um at the school of education there uh he developed the constructive de developmental theory which um uh, in a book the evolving self it was really formative for me in my uh, doctoral program and um it really helped me to kind of get a sense of how people make sense of themselves in the world and, um, and try to differentiate the self from the other and how that process takes place over the lifespan. Um, I think it, it definitely, for me, provides a lot of insight from an adult developmental perspective on what the research that we're doing and how that might also impact children uh, because of course this is a lifespan um, process and so it does start at birth um, and in fact he has a really great book um, called immunity to change where he talks a lot about how we are resistant and how we can look at our own mindset and um, overcome some of that resistance and i think a lot of that could apply to children as long as it's approached um, in a way that's developmentally appropriate and tom who, who or who, which key figure influenced you the most or what's the key book that's had the, the most impact on your practice? Well, for me, it's a pioneer in working with urban street corner youth and kids with conduct disorders. Fritz Radl, spelled R-E-D-L, and his book with David Weinman titled Children Who Hate. And it has a broken toy soldier held tightly in a clenched fist on the cover. And it's a book that made me think, gee, I want to teach the kids that few others want to teach. It was published back in 1951, even before my wrinkled old soul arrived in this granite planet, but it still has relevance for today for understanding group dynamics and dealing directly with uh, and productively and positively with kids with conduct disorders. Uh, Dr. Radel worked with uh, teens in trouble with school and the community and law enforcement. And he directed therapeutic efforts at these summer camps for these kids from inner city Detroit, Michigan. Um, uh, they were um, bussed up to what are known as fresh air camps in the wilds of upper Michigan. And he developed these conversational methods for reaching through the barb, the behavioral barbed wire to the value systems and the motivational switches inside these students. And he developed techniques that um, uh, known as the life space interview, which were later updated by Nick Long into the life space crisis interview in the conflict cycle, ways of explaining why it is that adults and kids get into escalating arguments and disagreements and how to avoid and escape them in the best interests of the youth. Sean, Tom and Kelly, that's been an absolutely fascinating insight into your research thank you for very much uh, thank you very much for being on the podcast uh, i'm sure all our listeners will have found that fascinating